Amen. I've had the wonderful privilege of fellowshipping with Brother Booker, and I had the wonderful opportunity of introducing him on Friday night with my critique of his ministry and life. This morning, I want to ask Brother Urshan to come and introduce him and get his perspective to see whether it matches mine or not. (laughs) Brother Urshan, God bless you. Thank you, Brother Sandy. The man that's coming to this pulpit right now is not a stranger to the apostolic world. Um, The other day, I was speaking to somebody, and they said to me, have you read Brother Booker's life story, his testimony? He said it's one of the most impacting testimonies you'll ever hear, how God reached down into seeming chaos and pulled a man out and then Brother Booker he said to me can you imagine if Brother Booker had not responded to the voice of God and his statement to me then was the apostolic world would be very different than what it is today Brother Booker has ministered to tens of thousands of people. God has given him a very unique gift and voice. His perspective is, it's vast. Beyond his ministry that most folks know, he helped my family in a very dark time with words of wisdom and comfort. And he helped me get footing and find my balance in a turbulent time. And so what he is publicly here, he is privately. And probably one of his greatest testimonies is his family. Because you see the man and you hear the breadth of his ministry. But when you see his sons and you see their the character and their integrity and their vision and their leadership skills... You just say, what kind of a man would rear sons that would carry and embody these traits? It's an amazing, it's an amazing thing to see the whole picture. And if anybody can see the whole picture, because there's many, many lives that are touched that nobody ever knows about, and conversations that are held that nobody ever has access to. That's the man that's coming to this pulpit right now. He is a great leader. He is a poet prophet. Amen. And we love him very much. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Brother Booker, come and preach the word of God to us. Oh, let's love the Lord together. God, we love you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. God, we love you. Amen. Thank you, Brother Urshan. That was so kind. I wish my wife would have been here. Praise God. And all I can say about my boys is my my three boys have got the most wonderful mother in the world. (laughs) Uh, You may be seated. I want to say it is uh, a distinct honor to be here. This is uh, 45, we're marking 45 years of ministerial labor of love, labor of truth, labor of compassion, amen, and, and, and to carry on the work of God in one place arduously for 45 years takes a passion. And, and God bless Brother and Sister Sandy so very, very, very much. And um, we're also in a, as has been mentioned, a transition season. And as an onlooker, both from afar and now near, Brother Sandy, you're doing this with as much class as I have ever seen. And we honor you 
And I mean that. It's a class act. It's a class act. You're doing it. You're doing it just right. And, and you're classy people. And I don't know how God weighs all this stuff in the scales, but you can rest assured he weighs it. And, um, I mean, you can't give a cup of cold water, but what he's got a reward for you. And so every nuance, every action, every, every effort to see the work of God go forward and onward and upward is, is a unbelievably powerful and beautiful effort and, and has great, awesome reward. So we're here and we're glad to be that. It's also Father's Day. And uh, so God bless all you fathers. Amen. God bless you. We're happy. You know, there's a, there's a difference between siring children and being a father. Being a father. I, I read here a while back that in um, there was a major... U.S. federal prison, and before Mother's Day, someone came up with the idea. They they set many tables out, and they just they covered them with Mother's Day cards, free for the inmates. If they wanted to get one of the cards and send it to their mother, they wiped them out. They cleared them off. They cleared them off. They had to bring in more, and they cleared them off. And then they made sure that every Every inmate had one. The only inmates that didn't send Mother's Day cards were those that didn't have a mother. So they were so excited with the success of that that they did the same thing for Father's Day. And they were virtually untouched. The, they covered the tables with cards and they were virtually untouched. I'm going to tell you, it means something to be a father. It means something to step up to the plate and, and say, I'm going to be a father. So, amen, you have two fathers here. And I don't just mean fathers of children, but they are fathers. They are fathers. And, um, and so we appreciate that. And Brother Sandra, you've been a father in the spirit for many, many, many men. And, and Brother Urshan is... Um, his 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 stature in the arena of advice is also growing exponentially. So we just thank God for everything that He's doing. And now we come to a close of the Mutual Admiration Society, <laughs> and we're going to go to the Word of God. Praise God! I would like for us to stand, and we're going to go to the Book of Exodus, chapter number twenty-four. Exodus 24, amen, and uh, my portion of this is, uh, uh, is, is coming to a close here, and with it being the 45th anniversary of Brother Sandy's ministry uh, and, and Father's Day, I don't know how to honor you or Brother Sandy or God or Brother Urshan any more than just to preach the Word of God because that's what got us here. Amen. And we're going to go forward. So I'm going to read um, four verses, but the first two are in Exodus 24, verses 1 and 2. And I'm just thankful to the Lord. I'm excited about preaching this this morning. I feel like a bottle of pop that's all shook up and the thumb's about to go. Psh. Of course, it may just drip over the edge. <laughs> but, but anyway, we'll see what happens. Exodus 24, verse 1, And he, the Lord, said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, the 
but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. So then in verse, actually verse 9, we're going to read three more verses, 24 verse 9. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone. And as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, notice, they saw God. Let's pray and ask that God would talk to us today. Lord Jesus, we are mindful of you. We ask God that your hand, that your anointing would rest on every one of our hearts and minds. Give us your good, precious understanding of what you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you so much. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, in our setting here, in my opinion, we have 70 elders plus Moses, Aaron, two of his sons, achieving or receiving in this life what I would consider to be the uh, highest attainment of our faith walk. And that is actually they saw God. We're going to let that sink in on us a little bit. They saw God. Now, to the best of my knowledge, I have never seen an angel. I very possibly may have. I may have entertained an angel unawares. But to the best of my knowledge, I've never seen an angel. Now, I have seen many devils, but I've never seen an angel. I do have uh, several very, very good, dear, godly friends of mine. Some of them have already passed on, but through the years have shared with me, shared with me stories of their experiences with angels, actual angels, that are mind-boggling, many of them in their portent, really amazing. And, um, and I would love to see an angel. I would love to see it and, and know that. I have seen it. But I can't even imagine seeing God. Just so exhilarating and mind-boggling that would be. It's a different... An angel's a big dimension to me, but but God. So these men went with Moses up a mount. Now, I don't think they were really excited about going up there and seeing, and, and they probably didn't even realize what was going to happen. They did not, I'm sure, what was going to take place. But had they known, come on up here with me, we're going to see God, they probably would have said, no, thank you. The reason being, they had just recently, in the 20th chapter, had God come down. Nobody saw him of the masses of the children of Israel, the two to three million people. But Moses had set boundaries for them to not come too near Mount Sinai. And and then here came a thick darkness, here came a blackness, here came... Here came lightnings, here came thunders, here came the sound of trumpets that were increasing, increasing, and then God began to speak and the earth began to tremble and he began to give them the Ten Commandments until the people said, Stop! Moses, stop him! Don't let him speak. You you go up there. You go. Anything he tells you, we'll do, but please don't let him. And so now, apparently, up that same mountain, the Lord says, Moses, get these, and he names them and says, bring them up. So there was probably great trepidation just ascending that 
mountain. Now, seeing God in theophanies uh, took place, and Israel was aware of this history, but these weren't small matters. In, in the 32nd chapter of Genesis, we find Jacob at the brook Jabrok, and he's wrestling with a man. But somewhere in the process of this wrestling match, he realizes this is not just humanity, though it feels like it, wrestles like it. He is recognizing the spiritual significance. And, 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 and when the man speaks and says, it's about to be the light of dawn, let me go. He said, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. And I don't know what he expected by blessing, but when he came away from it, the sinew in his thigh was shrunk. He limped forever after, no longer walking in pace with man, but walking in pace with God. And God had changed his name from Jacob, which means guile or deceiver, to Israel, which means prince or power with God. But Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. I saw God, and I managed to not die. And that was not a small thing. We know later in the book of Judges, the 13th chapter, when Manoah and his wife, the mother and father of Samson, were getting their dealings and their marching orders of how to raise this child that was coming, when when this man at the sacrifice Manoah offered ascended up into the flames, up into heaven, Manoah cried out, we shall surely die because we have seen God. Just in that they feared. Later in the book of Daniel, no, no less a personage than Daniel. When he looked, he beheld a man clothed with linen. His loins were girded with fine gold of euphaz. His body was like the barrel. His face is the appearance of lightning. His eyes as lamps of fire. His arms and feet were like the colored of polished brass. The voice of his words was like the voice of a multitude. He saw the great vision and there remained, he said, no strength in me. His comeliness was turned to corruption. I retained no strength. Just from this theophonic realization that the angel of the Lord God was before him. Joshua saw none of that. He just saw a man come and so he walks out to him and says, are you on our side or the other side? Are you for us or against us? And he said, I have come as the captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face and worshipped because he realized who he was talking to. Now, later in Exodus 34, uh, when we, excuse me, Exodus 3, earlier, Exodus 3, when Moses was a shepherd out on the backside of the desert for 40 years, he sees a bush burning, but not being consumed. And he turns aside, and when the voice speaks out, take off thy shoes, you're standing on holy ground. He falls on his face and was fearful. He hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. Even in the form of a burning bush, he realized and he was afraid to look upon God. And then even in the New Testament, the Apostle John that would lay his head on the bosom of Jesus. And, and, and we see this at the Last Supper. He was referred to as the Beloved the beloved disciple, the beloved apostle. Now it's years later, he's in the spirit on the Lord's day on the forsaken Isle of Patmos, banished there when he turns to see a voice speaking with him. He sees seven golden candlesticks and in the middle of those seven candlesticks was one like unto the Son of Man. And it's a lot like Daniel's vision 
clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt with the paps with a golden girdle. His head and hairs were white like wool, and white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass that burned in a furnace. His voice was not the sound of a multitude, but the voice of many waters. Amen. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his hand on him and said, Fear not. I'm the first. I'm the last. I'm he that liveth. I was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, so this business of seeing God in however God chose to reveal Himself to them. And that's important. It's how He chooses to reveal Himself. At one point, Moses said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. He said, well, I'm sorry. You can't really see that and live. So I'll tell you what you do. You, you get hidden in this cleft of the rock here. And I'm going to pass by. And when I pass by, you kind of peek out from behind that rock. And I'm going to show you my backside. Because you can live if you experience that. Some believe that's when he caught the revelation that was all penned in Genesis as to how these things came about. Be that as it may. Amen. They're about to go up into this mountain. Now the writer of Hebrews describes what took place at that mount on the day that the Lord spoke as the sound of many waters. Amen. The thunders, the lightnings, the sounds of trumpets. And the writer of Hebrews said this mount burned with fire. He said, we've not come to that mount. We haven't come to the blackness, the darkness, the tempest, the sound of trumpet, the voice of words. Which voice when they heard, they entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. They could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it should be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. It shook Moses to his core. And so now Moses calls Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu and says, you 70, come with me. And so they make their way up. And in this process, amen, verse 11, and if you can, put verse 11 back up there. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw God and did eat and drink. Now, I've been reading this for 45 years. I'm not bragging, but I went through this eight times last year. And how is it those five words never stood out to me? They saw God and did eat and drink. Those last five words are some of the most common, very, very common words in our vocabulary. What did you guys do? We went out and ate. That's very common in Pentecostal vernacular. What did you do? Well, we went to eat. Where did you go last night? Where did we went to eat? What did you do last night? Well, actually, we had dinner. <laughs> and, and, and furthermore, it's very common in New Testament vernacular. Very common. And so I want you to think with me, if you were the wife or children of one of those 70 elders and, and, and you're watching your daddy go up with Moses, Mama, why is he going up in that mountain? Because Moses said God wanted him to. Oh my. And then, and then they come back and everybody's curious. And I, in my mind eye, I can just see as they come into the house and they're kind of wide eyed. And, and the wife said, what happened? He said, you ain't going to believe what happened. You, you better sit down for this. What happened? 
One, we saw God. (gasps) Then what? We had lunch. You do understand that don't really go together. We saw God. And then we had lunch. We ate and drank. You did what? We ate and drank. Why? Because, and understand, there's only one reason they would have ate and drank. They would have ne- it would have never entered their mind. Well, there's God. Let's have a, let's eat. Never. Except God said, eat and drink. Yes, sir. Now, what did they eat and drink? The only thing they could have eaten and drank was the offerings that they had probably taken up and offered. I don't think Moses said, take a snack lunch with you when we go up there. And so, how I missed those last five words for 45 years, God help me, I don't know. But we do know in 1 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All of it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. All of it's profitable to make us perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So what in the world is this business going on of this Jehovah God of the Old Testament that a few days before is speaking and the earth is quaking now brings them up, they see God and says it's time to eat and drink. Can I just propose to you that that day on that mount of law that God was giving them and us a glimpse, a glimpse of something of His nature. Of how grace, how Zion was going to operate one of these days. They were not rebuked for eating and drinking. They had to have been encouraged to so by Moses, i.e. God's idea for them to eat and drink. Can I propose to you that in this way, God was saying to the 70 elders and every other Hebrew and New Testament child of God that would ever read this, say there is a day coming, brothers and sisters, when the people of God, while standing on the Word of God, Standing on and in the ways of God, the laws of God, the mind of Christ, hallelujah, while adhering to his plan and his purpose and his will, at the same time would be fellowshipping with him would be enjoying His presence. It's more than just, yes, sir, it's, oh, Jesus, I love you. Oh, this is, you are so good. You are, amen. And God chose the most common everyday aspect of life to show. I want fellowship with you. Let's have lunch. Let's, let's, let's enjoy this. And, and pro- it probably took him a while to loosen up. And, and, and then maybe something sweet presence. Maybe Moses walked around and slept somewhere. Hey, come on, man, relax. Relax. This is how you eat it. You sure? Yeah. It's time to have a drink. No, man, relax. If God wanted to kill you, you'd already be dead. You think? So, kind of feels good up here, don't it? Yeah. Hey, Harold, I'm enjoying this. You? I never dreamed it could be like this. And they go home and what happened? We saw God and had lunch. Why did God do that? I don't know, but it was unique. Can I just give you something here? God knew there was a dispensation coming. There was a world 
where people would not, listen to me close, would not walk in some kind of tandem balance between law and grace. There is no tandem balance between law and grace. What we have is all in the grace of God. Grace is the balance. We got the balance in grace. In grace, we have the ability. Grace is not just unmerited favor. Grace is the ability to do the will of God. And when there's great grace on somebody, the more joy, the more, the more, the greater the grace, the more joyous is it to do the will of God. It doesn't matter if there was such great grace on the early church, they could sell everything they had and lay it at the apostles' feet and giggle about it. Because there was great grace on them. It felt good. It felt right. It was awesome. I've seen times when grace like that can sweep into a church. And please forgive me. Please, I'm not, I'm certain this is, it was a God thing. We had Carlton Watkins come, our church. We had about 160 members at that time. And he came and he preached to us and we had no idea what was... And we just, and he finished preaching and he was talking about giving and a little lady, she was a new convert sitting in the back, little Spanish lady. And she stood up crying and she said, I have saved a thousand dollars to go see my family in Mexico. And I, I feel like the Lord wants me to give it because we need a new building. And that started an avalanche. And those 500, those 160 people that night, that was kids and everybody, they gave over $500,000 that night. And there's not one rich person in our church, not one. People were standing up and saying, I'm taking a loan on my house. People stood up and said, I'm selling my car. One man stood up and he had just retired from a major corporation in the United States And he was weeping and he said, the Lord just told me to give my 401k. After an hour of this, I stopped it because I couldn't take it anymore. I was, we were, our church walked around numb for the next few days. The only thing that could have, there's a reason I'm telling you this. The only thing that could have happened that would have impressed us, touched us, affected us more would have been if Jesus Christ would have appeared on the cross and hung before us. But it was a grace that was on us. And the man that gave his 401k, he got the money and he wrote the check. And the next week that Check would not have been worth the paper it was written on because he retired from Enron. And God did indeed speak to him. And the man that borrowed $70,000 on his house sold that house three years later for five times what it was worth that day. And I could go on and on and on. And I just said that to tell you, we wouldn't be in the building we're in today except for the grace of God that hit us. The grace of God that hit us. And you say, was grace on everybody? Not quite everybody. I didn't even plan on saying this, but, but there was one guy sitting in the back. I'd been, I was his pastor and he, he told me later, he's sitting in the back. He said, I've been here before. I know what they're doing. They're probably, he said, and he, he just kept getting more fidgety. And I, yeah, they're just trying to, and he said, I ain't got nothing to give anyway. And God spoke to him and said, yes, you do. He said, God, I don't have nothing. And God said, you have equity in your house and I want it. And he started crying. He didn't know that the man he went to to find out about his house was my next door neighbor. My next door neighbor was, he was in real estate. He came and he said, hey man, you know Tim, and Tim goes to your church. Tim, I said, yeah. He said he wanted me to find out how much equity he had in his house. He said he had $37,000. We, we had it all appraised, $37,000 equity in his house. So I'm just throwing this figure out. Let's just say his house was was, uh, let's say he owed 200000 on it, and he, so he, it was worth 237000 He said, well, well you, I want to sell it. 
How much do you want to sell it for? Two thirty seven? He said, No, I want you to sell it for two seventy four. He said, You'll die in that house, but you'll never sell it for that. He said, Put it up for sale. He sold it in three days. So he gave thirty seven thousand dollars to the building fund, and the other thirty seven thousand he bought a house right by the church. Can I tell you, when you're in the presence of God and grace hits, there ain't no telling what you can do for God. I'm not tell- I'm just telling you, grace is the ability to do whatever the will of God demands. Whatever it is, grace is there. Hallelujah. There is a balance within grace. He can do it all. Paul said, I can do all things through grace. And I'm not telling anybody to do nothing. I'm just telling you, we couldn't do that today if we tried. I had to raise, I had to raise $27,000 the other day. It's the first time we've took up a special offering since the, since that night. It's the first time we've ever taken up a special offering since that night. And, and I had to raise $27,000. And they're beautiful people. Because the grace was not there. But we got 35 and we're happy. Praise God. Amen. That's what happens when parking lots go bad. You gotta fix them or they'll get away from you. All right? So, so it's just life. But I'm telling you, I've seen what God can do. I've seen how, and he has a dispensation. He says, I don't want to just be with you. I came that you could have life more abundantly, richly and gloriously. He wants us to dearly, deeply, profoundly enjoy his presence. That's what he's talking about. Amen. We saw God. And he said, now I want you to enjoy my presence. Let's eat and drink. Let's enjoy each other's presence. We're in a dispensation. Listen to me. Where God desires. With a, he deeply desires to be radically, personally involved in your life. He's not a God of far off. This is the plan of the ages. This is the reason that the Holy Ghost is the most beautiful message. He wants to come and live in you. And you receive His Spirit. Hallelujah. I remember when I was a hippie idiot, but I, but I had repented. And I was reading my Bible. I was reading the book of Palms and the book of Genesis. And, 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 and I didn't understand what I was reading. But I, I got to the book of Acts. I'm reading about the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost. I didn't know what the Holy Ghost was. What's the Holy Ghost? What's the Holy Ghost? And I called a buddy of mine. I said, because he had a touch of spirituality most of the time, sometimes. And, and I, said, I said, Eddie, you know anything about the Holy Ghost? Yeah, man, he's awesome. I said, you know about the Holy Ghost? Yeah. I said, you got the Holy Ghost? Oh, yeah. I said, how do you know you got it? He said, because it feels good, man. I said, really? Yeah. I said, Eddie, yeah. You been drinking? He said, I've had some, yeah. Well, I feel good when I take a shower. But that don't mean I got the Holy Ghost. But I'm going to tell you something. I remember the night I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Radically, personally, he came to live inside of me. It's rich, it's deep, it's beautiful. What happened? I saw God and had fellowship. Let me give you the title of what I want to preach to you about. Well, I guess what I am preaching about. This is called Seeing God, Loving Life and feasting with Him. Seeing God, loving life, enjoying life, and feasting with Him. This is the dispensation He had in mind. Don't go through life cheated of less than what God wants you to have of experience and walk and talk with God. Now, let me show you some just a couple of things here. Let it be noted, there's a lot of people in this world that eat and drink without ever seeing God. He's never in the equation. 
anywhere or in anything. They have no regard whatsoever. And many do not even desire to see him. There are vast multitudes. They daily partake of food and drink. And they feel no indebtedness in any way to anything about God. These seemingly successful people enjoy blessings and prosperity. And God's not in their spectrum. So they eat and drink. But God's not there. They feel like they've got it because they've been diligent, persevering, and deserving. They see nothing in God. So there's no thrill of appreciation. There's no overwhelming vibration in their heart. They're just eat, drink, and be merry. But they're not seeing God. I'm here to tell you, you're only half alive until you come alive in God. The richness, the glory, the sweetness, how beautiful it is. I've got a, I've got a, I have, I still have. She's been dead a few years. She was a great, great, great woman of God. She was like my mother. Her name was Marilyn Chenault. I could tell you stories all day long. She would never tell you she was a prophetess, but she was. I could tell you mind-boggling stories. I don't even know if I'd still be living for God if it wasn't for the times God used her in clutch, unbelievable situations. But she was married at 15. I knew her mother. They were always praying people. She married Wayne Chenault. And he was working and he was 17 and and they were so poor. They were so poor. One day she was, she was, she was, and there's problems and she was washing clothes in a little tiny kitchen sink in a little tiny house. And she was crying and praying, washing the little clothes. And, and she said, all of a sudden, she began to feel the presence of the Lord. And then she felt the presence of the Lord stronger. And she felt the presence of the Lord stronger. And she dropped the clothes and she stepped away from the sink. She felt his presence stronger. Overwhelmingly. And she turned at their tiny little table. And Jesus was sitting at her table. And she fell at his feet as one dead. And he put his hand on her head. And then he touched her hand and said, Marilyn, and he lifted her up, set her in the chair, and said, I want to show you what a friend I can be. And they talked for 30 minutes. I knew her mother. Her mother told me this story after I talked to Marilyn. And her mother went, this was about 10 in the morning, and She went to her house and she started to knock on the door, but she could hear her daughter talking with someone in the side. And she said she could feel the presence of God. She didn't know who she was talking to, but she she didn't knock because she... And so later that afternoon, she came back and said, Marilyn, who are you talking to today? And she said, Mama, why? Because she wasn't going to tell anybody. I heard you talking to someone. Marilyn, I heard you talking to a man in your house, but I could feel the presence of God. What was going on? And she told her mother. And so a couple of weeks went by and her husband would come home for lunch. And there was nothing to feed him. They were out of food. His little bit of white rice for breakfast was the last of it. And he was about to come home and she said, Jesus, he works so hard. I don't have anything to feed my hardworking husband. And she heard a voice say, go look in the cupboard. And by that little sink, she opened the door and there was crackers and peanut butter and oatmeal and bread 
and he came home and they and they lived off of that for three or four days and he was coming home and the food was all gone and she said Jesus I he said go look in the cupboard she opened it up there was more rice beans there was even some big potatoes there was They had off of that three or four days and it was a Friday and he was coming home. I have nothing to feed him. She heard nothing. She even went, opened it up two or three times. Finally, he came home for lunch and she said, baby, I'm so sorry. I don't have anything to feed you. He said, don't worry about it. He said, it's Friday. I get paid tonight. Baby, they gave me a raise. And they made the raise retroactive past last three weeks. We're going out to eat tonight. I want to show you what a friend I can be. We're in the last days. I'm here to tell you it's time to get to know him. It's time to enjoy him. Now, a flip side of also this is that there are people that don't, they eat and drink, but they don't really seem to enjoy it because for some reason they're like the thought of the presence of God and they, they don't take comfort in His presence. There's some people, they feel like His presence is like a haunting, stalking specter and they're afraid of God. He's like some executioner. Or some, he's ready to, to come and get them when they do something wrong. And I married a girl like that. And the reason my wife was like that is because she she had a father that was an alcoholic and he was not a father. He wouldn't have got a card from one of his sons. Brutal and mean and cruel and bestial. It was nothing for him to come home drunk two o'clock in the morning. The house would be spick and span because they had to keep it that way. Not much of a house and not much to spick, but there it was because... He was cruel. And if he found so much as a little bit of garbage in a dish strainer in the sink, he would start ripping up flour sacks, sugar sacks, throwing them all over the house, breaking dishes, throwing pans. Amen. Cutting open pillows, throwing pillows, feathers everywhere, getting a coat hanger and making a whip out of it and beating his children till they were bloody. And then he'd go pass out in bed and say, when I get up, this house better be spotless. And they'd work through the night and then try to hide their wounds as they'd go to school the next day. But she got the Holy Ghost when she was 10 years old. She became a Sunday school kid. But embedded back in her mind, Because he was a father image, was a God that one day would come home when maybe she hadn't prayed enough. That would make sure that when the trumpet sounded, she wouldn't be quite ready. And I married her. I felt it the first time I ever saw her. I was praying for a boy to get the Holy Ghost at camp meeting. And all these young people, and I looked at her. And I said, that's the girl I'm going to marry. And then after service, we were eating around the snack shack and talking with other young people. We went back to the dorms and, and my, my, one of my old hippie buddies, Ed, Eddie, that thought he knew about the Holy Ghost. Now he had it. But he was in the bunk above me and he said, hey, you know that Brenda girl? I said, yeah. He said, I kind of like her. I put my foot on the bunk and shoved him into the stratosphere. And when he landed, I said, Eddie, forget her. I'm going to marry her. And I put my, looked out the window and I thought, I'm losing my mind. One of the things that also sold me on her, she was the first generation of, 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 of Bible quizzers ever. She was on the first team the first year and she memorized almost all of Genesis. And I thought, if she did that, she's a scholar. Well, so we got married and everything was wonderful until 
the shakes would come. And she'd lie on the bed and cry and sob. And the reason I can tell you this, she said, you can tell my story as long as it helps somebody. And she cried such fearfulness. And I said, honey, that's not the way Jesus is. But she had it in her mind. He's going to beat me some night, but I'm not quite ready to meet him. There will be a little bit of garbage in my dish strainer. And it's not going to go well. So I began praying. I won't tell you why. I knew God would talk to her. But I knew he would. I will say this. I used to have a girlfriend before I even got the Holy Ghost. She was losing it. And I started praying. I said, God, talk to her. And he did. He spoke audibly to her. She didn't know I was praying. So I knew God would talk to my wife. I knew he would. And I said, Jesus, I've told her that you love her, but you have to tell her. She's got to hear it from you. I've told her and told her. I said, talk to her, talk to her. I thought I could pray three or four nights. If I missed a night, I don't remember. I prayed every night for 18 months that God would talk to my wife and she could realize what this dispensation is really all about. And I didn't even know the word dispensation then, but that's what I was born. And, and so one night we were in service in, in, our, in our local church, and it was a small home missions church. We had a man preaching, and he preached the will of God. It needed to be preached. It needs to be preached. He preached on hell. And he got into it explicitly and painfully and agonizingly. And I knew it was right and I knew it needed preach. But the problem was I knew what it was doing to my wife next to me. I could feel her tension. And I'd reach over and touch her hand and it was like touching this wood. So I went to the altar over here and she knelt at the far pew over here. And while the few of us, there's 20, 25 people were praying and crying, I could hear my wife over there. She sounded like a wounded shot animal. I could hear her groans. I could feel her agony. And all I could do was say, Jesus, you've got to talk to me. And then I heard a new sound. I heard laughter and worship. And I looked over. Her hands were in the air, tears coming down her cheek, and she was laughing and worshiping God. Well, I continued praying, and when it was over, my wife, she used to get scared when I'd pray a lot. If I stayed late at the church, prayed, she'd get scared because she was afraid I was going to come home with some new conviction. And so she came up this night, and I was down there praying, and she said, are you going to keep praying or come home now? I said, I think, I th- I think I'm going to pray a while. Good, I'll see you later. That's different. We'd been married almost three years, and we had no child, and we began to wonder if maybe we were going to be able to have children. I walked in. She's sitting in the chair. She's smiling. She said, guess what? I said, what? She goes, we're going to have a baby. When? I don't know, but he's he's coming. I said, what happened tonight? She said, well, you know what was preached? I said, yes. You can imagine how it affected me. I said, I know. She said, Larry, I was over praying. She said, it was hideous. And then all of a sudden, I heard a voice. It said, I love you. 
And she, she knew, and she turned to no one, and she said, Jesus, is that you? And he said, I love you, Brenda. I love you. And she said, Larry, I had a vision. It's the only vision my wife's ever had in her life. She saw three things. The first thing she saw was a cross slowly turning in every direction. And she knew he died for everybody, including me. The second thing she saw was a shepherd holding a little trembling lamb and stroking its head and snugging it up. And she said, it was Jesus, and I knew I was the little lamb, but he was holding me and loving me. And the third thing, she said, I saw myself sitting in a rocking chair with a baby over my shoulder, rocking like crazy. She said, we're going to have a baby. And I told my pastor the next day, I said, we're going to have a baby. He said, when? I said, I don't know, but it's coming. And so Joel Matthew Booker was born 10 months later. Gift of God, honoring God. And he had colic. And the only way he would sleep was in a rocking chair being rocked. Literally, you laid him down. And in three months, I stopped at three months, but during that three months, we broke two rocking chairs, rocking. But we said God had his number. God had his and God still has his number. And the hand of God is on him by the mercies of God. Can I tell you, we're talking about a good God. And from that night, my wife made her turn. She enjoys God. She loves God. She found out you can see him and love life and feast with him. We're talking about a good God. When we understand his word and his grace and the efficacy of his blood, let's all stand. Hallelujah. If you don't enjoy God because maybe you've done something wrong, He has a word for you in 1 John 1. Confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse from all unrighteousness. Just mean business. Mean business. He's not willing that anybody should perish. He just wants you to come to repentance. You got three boys. Those boys were not always angels. There was times I'd be gone preaching, 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 and they'd drive my wife crazy. I'd come home, and she would give me the goods. She always said, two days before you were coming back, they were, oh, mama, you're so sweet. She goes, I know what you're doing. You're trying to, you're trying to get your dad off your trail. And I'd, I, I remember one time I'd come home, and she had, I want to go to And they were, I said, go to the bedroom. They went to the bedroom. This actually happened. As I'm going out of the room, I take off my belt. My wife could see it. I'd go into the bedroom. They'd be sitting there. I'd say, I'm fixing to hit this mattress three times. I'm going to hit it hard and loud. And, and I want you to scream like you're dying. You hear me? All right, Philip, your turn. Grandma, ah! now run out there and hug your mom. Oh, oh, we love you. <laughs> One time, yeah, give us some background music. One time, we're driving down the road and they're in the back fussing. I know no parents ever had this. You're lying. I'm not lying. You did too. I did not. Be quiet. Be quiet. I s- I'm sorry if this is not in. I said shut up. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and a voice out of the back seat. I can't believe it. A Pentecostal preacher that doesn't care that one of his kids is a liar. I'm not a liar. You are a liar. But not one time ever 
Did I threaten, say, or even think? You're out of here. I'm putting you up for adoption. Get up. Hit the road. Never crossed my mind. It was my babies. I knew what it was to be adopted when I was in the fourth grade. And I never had a daddy that I ever knew. My father adopted me and changed my name to Booker. And I knew what it was to be adopted when I was a 19-year-old hippie. Messed up on drugs! And I took on the name of Jesus. And received the Holy Ghost. He's chastened me many times because he loves me, cares about me. At one point, he has a word. I'm going to point unto your kingdom. My father pointed unto me. Listen, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. We're going to eat and drink with him. Acts 10. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen of God, with whom he did eat and drink after he rose from the dead. He rises from the dead. And of all the things he could have done, he ate and drank with them. One time when they were out fishing. And he said, come and dine. They said, that's the Lord. If you're here today. And you're. Wandering your way through life. Going through the motions. Working, getting paychecks, taking vacations, purchasing, making payments to someday die and say goodbye. Can I tell you something? There's a better life for that. He wants you to have life more abundantly. He wants to show you he's a friend that's closer than a brother. He wants you to see what this can be like. The righteousness, the peace, the joy in the Holy Ghost. What you need to do is remember he died, was buried, rose again. And we die in repentance. We're buried in baptism. And we rise to walk in newness of life through the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Is there anybody thankful for the walk with God that he's made for us? Does anybody want to draw closer to him? Anybody want to say, Jesus, I want you to show me what a friend you can be. I want to wring out every drop of our relationship that you want me to have with you. Maybe you'd just like to step out today and come down and say, Jesus, count me in. I want to know you closer. And if you've never yet met him in the power of the Holy Ghost, he loves you today, ma'am. Sir, he cares about you more than you can possibly imagine. You don't have to go through your days without rich purpose. Come on, he loves you. Come on, sir. Come on, ma'am. This altar is open for everybody that would like to feast with him. Come on, sir. Come on, man. He loves you. Come on, young man. Come on, young lady. He's got a good life for you. He's got a beautiful life for you. Come on, mama. Come on, daddy. I just
step on out. Come on down. Let God do something beautiful in your world. This is Father's Day. This is Father that loves you, that cares about you. He's here to help you. Jesus, have your way in my life, in my world. You are my friend. You are my God. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Come on, sir. Come on, man. Don't get your chance. God wants to do something real and rich in your life today. He's got, he's got, oh, he loves you, come on, that's it, that's it, that's it, he loves you. Oh, my Jesus. 
nations that tug a war to me all day long I struggle for answers that I need and then I come into his prayer All my questions become pleased for a sacred moment. No doubt can interfere. Oh! 